together? How do you get the relevant information from each of them? Okay, let's first go to where we um, are. Uh, so these are the slides and let's go to the place where you are. Um, okay, we are talking, uh, uh, let's first start with the emoji question, right? Uh, let's see. Here is the, um, here's a discussion on emoji. So, this work is, this does look really good. Julian, can you, can you mute yourself? Um, so, the emoji sense disambiguation work is not really about uh, only uh, emojis or, 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 or it's not understanding just emoji alone. It is the using of the context provided by the text. So simple answer to the question about what if there were just the um, uh, image or emoji alone, uh, a pixelated, uh, you know, picture. Well, I mean, that, that's not this, this work does not uh, help you with that alone. At the end of the day, um, the point I'm trying to get across here for uh, uh, the topic of knowledge will propel machine understanding of content is that I need to be able to connect the content to the knowledge. And um, yes, I could connect uh, possibly an image to a content, uh, to a knowledge, but uh, here all the examples we have taken are ones where um, you have text and emoji and that uh, you are getting more sense information from emoji. So um, uh, the, uh, there, was a, there is a whole resource on emoji net that is kind of currently gone when I moved from uh, right set to here, uh, those guys deleted all the data, but there is a Kaggle data sets here uh, called emoji net, a machine readable uh, dictionary of emoji meaning. And um, this is, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, JSON um, uh, file has all of that content that was created by my student, uh, for, former student Sanjaya Viyaratne. So um, the idea was to provide, let me see if I can uh, pull up. Um, um, so this is the paper, where is the corresponding, uh, I thought I'd uh, gotten the paper, uh, let's see. So 40, 40, well, let me get that. There is a version of the paper, uh, pull it up. Expand. So you look at this example, and um, uh, with the emoji, there are variety of senses. You can see in the table: uh, laugh, happy, funny, or kill, short, anger, or uh, costly, work hard, money, right? And um, these are all the senses in which those emojis are used. And the question is, what is the sense in which the, in particular tweet that emoji is used? And so um, the point here is that um, imagine uh, just using machine learning and trying to make a sense out of which sense this emoji has been using without having a knowledge that these are all the possible options. It's very hard or impossible or you know uh, difficult to get any good results uh, just using uh, emoji. So um, what Sanjaya had done was to um, uh, create a in this case an octuple of emoji, and he had um, uh, for example uh, the this is emoji for face with tears of joy. Uh, then there is a definition 
a smiling face with curved tear filled eyes. Then there are some keywords, face, joy, laughter, uh, cry happy. Then images are there. Then and different, uh, you know, um, platforms use the same emoji but different picturization. Then related emojis are there. Then there is emoji category like smiley and people. And there are senses, the feeling of happiness, the emotion of great happiness. And, uh, uh, you know, BevelNet provides the, uh, you know, uh, reference uh, senses. And uh, this is uh, what, this is the content of EmojiNet. Uh, so this is the knowledge base, right? And then the, the whole, uh, you know, the whole idea here is to demonstrate how creation of such an availability of such knowledge improves um, understanding of emoji and uh, how much improvement does it get, right? So that is what uh, the whole, um, this whole, uh, um, keynote or this whole uh, paper that we are discussing today is all about that and that uh, even today um, uh, there are uh, more um, papers coming out and more uh, products that are not yet using knowledge and uh, here this one demonstrates with four examples very diverse examples what are all the uh, you know some you know how knowledge plays a very very critical role in understanding anything and okay. we're going to um, uh, if you uh, if you pay attention to uh, some of the um, um, you know uh, video uh, let's see which one is this no no we don't want to discuss this today so if you if you pay attention to um, uh, some of the earlier slides uh, and, and, and the you know, discussions I've had, they would uh, be about, um, um, that, they give you, that, that gave you insight into, uh, you know, important role of knowledge in many different ways. Each of the four application we picked has um, a particular message to convey. And um, uh, I'm more than happy to discuss them as you go along. Uh, as you go along when you have questions okay uh, next question so so the simple answer uh, for your question of emoji alone um no this is not about uh, you know uh, improving uh, image processing uh, for that matter it is about um, understanding better the uh, context or the sense in which that emoji is used so you actually understand uh, more clearly more uh, you know uh, because many most the point is that every uh, emoji most emojis have multiple uh, definitions or multiple uses uh, after all um, uh, and so there is a lot of ambiguity ambiguity is one of the hardest problem to check um, to 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 solve for machines and uh, humans are much better at solving the ambiguity because they have much broader context uh, of what's happening. Uh, machines have very narrow context. Uh, they're looking at a file, they're looking at an image, uh, they don't have a big history, they don't know who is, who is saying what and what is the history with them, they don't know the culture, they don't know the linguistic knowledge in, in, in a very comprehensive way. So, so, um, for machines to understand, uh, you know, the content enough and disambiguate is challenging, and that is what this thing is about. Uh, there was another question. What was that? Mine was on <clears throat> the multimodal um, evaluation and how to, I guess, comp concatenate all the information after you gather it. For, yeah, that one there from the multimodal. Uh, data streams <coughs> so the the best example of that was this uh, um, you know on multimodal aspect of it the best um, example that uh, i discussed was uh, related to this example of uh, of transportation let me first uh, i'll explain to you in more detail but let me first go to the uh, uh, so this is the uh, main paper, uh, uh, which is cited by the way in the paper also, understanding city traffic dynamics using sensors and textual observation. 
So the general idea was that um, um, uh, you have a uh, uh, you, you want to be able to understand traffic um, in a city or metro area, and um, there are a um, lot of um, you want to understand when a traffic is going slow why is it going slow that is the core question right suppose you are um, <coughs> sitting sitting in the you know big um, transportation management office uh, transportation department you can see all kinds of video feeds coming into uh, the um, uh, on the tvs and uh, you have all kinds of data coming into your uh, control center and you want to be able to understand um, why um, and, and let's assume that you know you're not going to have video at every intersection or every uh, uh, you know road link uh, you have st at strategic positions you'll have it but a lot of, lot of places there won't be so um, the problem is very complex i want you to appreciate the complexity of the problem one of the complexity of the problem is that traffic is um, different at different time of the day. At the rush hour on the Bay Bridge in um, Silicon Valley in, in Bay Area, the traffic is always going to be slow. On the weekdays particularly so, even on the weekend some hours are slow, but on the weekdays um, uh, at the morning and uh, evening uh, rush hours, uh, the traffic is going to be slow. Some other times traffic will be uh, moving faster. So how do you, so you need to understand what is the normal situation on the road network, right? In this particular case, um, for every um, uh, uh, road link, that two more, uh, something like 2000 or some such road links, um, for every, uh, for each hour of the day, 24 hours, for each day in a week, you are trying to create the normality of data over a long period of time, the entire year of uh, data uh, of the sensor um, in picked uh, traffic uh, speed. Speed, uh, speed of vehicles on that road for every hour, 168 different types of hours. So. Uh, 24 hours times, uh, you know, uh, seven days. You are trying to find uh, the um, uh, normal speed uh, situation. Then you are trying to understand, <clears throat> and, and the point here is that um, how do you model such a sensor data? And uh, here uh, it, we discussed uh, in the paper that. Um, a probabilistic graph model, in particularly a more uh, comprehensive, more, more uh, uh, rich uh, probabilistic graph model called linear dynamical system, is the best, um, what was the more appropriate uh, representation of the traffic pattern. Right? Then there is a question of uh, training this um, model, especially for uh, identification that, for finding that now the traffic is anomalous that um, it is not in the log likelihood range for various hours and it this is uh, using the uh, models uh, to tag or anomalies which can be tied to city event uh, event reported on textual uh, stream so um, uh, through the annotation for variety of uh, times the traffic became too slow for that hour um, away from the normal uh, you know traffic you will see on that day of the on that hour when the traffic was anomalous you tag the data to say that uh, this was uh, slow because of an accident this was slow because of a uh, road net uh, road repair this was slow because a uh, the a nearby stadium had a major uh, sports event. So these are the kind of, um, uh, you know, anomalies, uh, you know, the explanation of why traffic 
the slow is created. Then uh, comes the issue of finding an explanation. So one of the, the, the interesting thing that we wanted to um, you know, uh, do is to explain. A, once we figure out that traffic is anomalous, they by finding the tweets in the geographical area of interest and the time of interest, right? So uh, traffic is slow at a particular point of time and is slow at a particular geographic region in a particular road, right? So are there any tweets from that area around that time that could explain why the traffic is slow? Right, and then, then the whole is that once you know the reason that traffic is slow, you can better predict um, how the traffic will become normal, how long it might take, what kind of emergency crews you need to send, all that kind of um, traffic management issues that you need to you, you want to do, it will be able to do that. Now, here I explain a particularly exciting and particular challenging thing that cannot be done without a knowledge so um, here there are uh, first of all here there is a notion of context that in that uh, time and uh, location that's one thing second is here you can see the peak peak means this is uh, 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 you know uh, the number of cars per uh, uh, time unit so uh, very few cars uh, sorry uh, um, so th this is a time so if it takes long, lot time, lo, long time to pass through a, a particular road, then uh, there is a um, slow traffic. So that is the event that has occurred. And we found that in the region that we are talking about, there are all these tweets. Now we process those tweets through an ontology or knowledge graph. In this case, domain knowledge in the form of traffic vocabulary. So for example, this one is modeling accident involving variety of objects involving um, uh, bicycle involving motorcycle involving train involving truck involving pedestrian involving hazardous material and so on and so forth right so this is the model and you are uh, uh, kind of annotating the tweet uh, automatically with regards to variety of things now remember you have to figure out um, uh, what is the location of the street? This is a difficult problem. Uh, there is no coordinate associated with the tweet. So what is the location? So in this case, um, on the golden highway at the Viking robots in Devlin, JHB. And then there is truck um, in Overton injury treating themselves, uh, you know, injured treating themselves. So that's what the tweet is about, right? So you need to understand the location. Then you you look to you, you need to look up the geocoding, and then you find the location uh, for which you have traffic information, and you see oh traffic is slow here. Okay, they are around the same time and around the same location. Hence, it is possible that this tweet is relevant to that particular thing. Uh, you know that potential uh, slowness of traffic. So. It's possible that this tweet explains uh, this slowness of traffic. So uh, you look at, if you think through this uh, uh, um, uh, example, if you did not have the knowledge base like this, which could further improve, by the way, uh, you know, uh, uh, entity extraction, then you'll be in big trouble. Then, then uh, this problem becomes uh, nearly impossible or impossible to solve. So that is a key issue. Uh, uh, and key takeaway from that particular um, uh, example that you have two modality here. Modality is the road sensor and uh, tweets, which uh, with the you know textual tweets. So uh, connecting these two modalities is impossible or nearly impossible, but for the uh, availability of uh, knowledge, uh, a particular in this case, there are three different knowledge pieces that were used. I'm showing one for simplicity, the uh, uh, the traffic vocabulary. Uh, there is another one for uh, city events, another one for something else, or for location. Uh, 
uh, geocoding. So there are three knowledge bases that are used in this particular problem solving. And the, you know, the uh, if you want a very important thing, I want you to uh, understand is uh, you know any uh, you know very early on I made these um, um, uh, important points that I hope you understood. Right? Um, what makes um, computerized system um, uh, uh, you know? Uh, what, what, what would it take for computer system to be more powerful? And um, there is, uh, there are multiple things, um, and I, I'll talk about this more in the next class, semantic community perceptual computing. Uh, and, um, but this is a huge area uh, of, of now interest of using knowledge in um, machine learning and deep learning and also um, uh, using neuroscience or brain inspired computing to make more intelligent uh, machines. Uh, the very important point here is that um, the data is very numerous. There's a lot of data. A uh, human senses uh, uh, bombard your, our brain with roughly 11 million bits per uh, second of data. But from all that data, you and I are I'm not bothered. We are not worried, oh, there's so much data coming in, I can't make any sense of it. No, our brain works so efficiently and it converts all that massive amount of data into something that is very abstract that can be described in few um, uh, bits and bytes. So what does it look like? What does it mean? And I give a very, very simple example here. This is pedagogy, as I mentioned in my you know, video. I hope you have watched this video and then coming to this uh, you know, class. But this one, um, it's a very fundamental thing that uh, helps us uh, understand the challenge that any computerized system for that you want to make intelligent has the sensors that are out there and there are probably around 50 billion sensors today uh, called internet of things that are constantly relaying data on and putting the data on the internet right 50 billion uh, you, uh, some of you might remember if you well not not in south kenya but uh, we moved from uh, dayton and earlier we have lived in colder places where we would uh, be going to for skiing uh, on ski slopes and there will be a uh, video camera mounted on the um, slope so we'll be called you can you know uh, go on the website and click on a button and you can start seeing uh, streaming uh, video coming from um, slopes so that is an internet of thing that's a video uh, you know internet thing uh, there may be uh, the temperature then when you look up the temperature that's again internet of thing there is a temperature measurement device that's out there there is a device on the road uh, you know, little uh, pole, and then that the multiple uh, sensors are mounted. One is the wind speed and direction. Those are being constantly relayed and picked up and put on a website or available through API. So one of them gives you 150, right? I have a um, you know machine. Here is my machine actually. This is my machine. This is a blood pressure measurement device, right? Now uh, it gives. Uh, you know, uh, it reads 150, that's data. But then, um, uh, when I label the data, it is labeled, you know, you guys all should be familiar with labeling, supervised learning. It's systolic blood pressure of 150 mmHg. mmHg is the unit, and the type of, it, it gives you two uh, types of blood pressure, systolic and diastolic. So it says this is systolic, right? If you're diastolic 150, then you're probably nearly dead. Uh, then uh, that is called information. And then comes, uh, so what does it mean, 150 mmHg? Well, it means that this particular, based on uh, uh, clinical standards for, and, and there is a National Institute of Health um, Committee 7, that uh, uh, and maybe now it is eight 
they come up with um, what are the normal what are the ranges for um, uh, normal uh, blood pressure at a particular age uh, elevated blood pressure and there is a hypertension level one two and three right so um, uh, when it is not normal it is called elevated uh, particularly for the uh, systolic blood pressure and um, when it is elevated uh, that is a knowledge then it is also it, it also tells you that it is elevated and um, the recommendation is that you need to get you know you need to get a treatment you need to manage this blood pressure bring it down that is knowledge but yet doctor would not be able to just give you any medication based on just uh, the fact that it is elevated blood pressure um, doctor needs to find out with additional tests why is it elevated it could be elevated because of hypothyroidism then you have one class of drugs but if it, it could be because of blood pressure then there are seven different classes of drugs available right on right hand side what you see is representation formalism so there are multiple there are different levels at which you at the low level you have just characters and you know, ascii code and text and then it becomes uh, more um, you know richer represent so rdf resource description framework and we talked about rdf and property graph in one of the previous classes uh, that also has a, a corresponding graph model so it, it is either a triple or a graph model or quad even we talked about uh, having a time um, so that is the uh, uh, you know representation appropriate for um, you know representing information and then you want to be able to capture the knowledge um, you can do it with rdf and rdfs uh, to partial level but you want to have a richer model uh, then you may have something like um, uh, the web ontology language and there are others okay so these are the um, you know different representation of what started as just the data right and uh, this is um, what many people miss out on so um, uh, some of these we have seen there okay so uh, now this general thing uh, is what are we doing here we are doing the concept is called abstraction uh, in my uh, way of thinking uh, in making things uh, more human like and intelligent you have to worry about three things one is context right and uh, we had talked about uh, issue of uh, in, in my video i talked about um, john smith and there are many john smith which john smith it is right or uh, earlier if you remember uh, when we talked about semantic search engine we said there is a content and this is in the context of baseball okay, when you do classification you are trying to build a context the second is personalization each of us are different human beings and each of us have different preferences and different uh, biases and all that stuff and uh, you suppose you're talking to a, a chatbot a machine and he does not know what you guys talked about yesterday or or just in fact in the previous conversation you're having conversation you just um, you know a few minutes ago i uh, had also conversation well the machine that does not know what was the previous conversation is seen as dumber compared to the machine that knows the previous conversation it has a history of historical knowledge of all the conversation and in fact it uses in understanding what you are conversing now right so um uh, that is the personalization when you start to get that and the third thing is um, abstraction we humans can convey our thoughts in um, you know a few words or suppose uh, suppose um, uh, i um, uh, 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 suppose somebody knows us uh, you know uh, this this part of medication uh, medicine somewhat and suppose i say hey uh, i'm taking losartan for managing my uh, you know blood pressure the person does not always say that oh, okay i'm being treated for elevated blood pressure the person knows that right because he has that knowledge the knowledge of 
you know, uh, systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure, uh, a lot, you know, proper range, high range, ultra high range, the levels of uh, elevated blood pressure, the reasons for elevated blood pressure, the class of drugs, that's the knowledge graph for ontology. And the, all the connected knowledge is all available, right? And more, more importantly, they, you can talk about the things at a abstract level, uh, imagine that you are in a museum and um, you and uh, your friends friend are exchanging, um, you know, what you like in that painting. And the, your conversation will have a lot of abstract ideas. And they are a lot of abstract, they, they are abstract because it doesn't, you know, uh, what the way you think may be not something the way other person thinks. Right? And yet, your your language is powerful enough for you to convey to your uh, friend what you're thinking about it and the other person has a reasonable interpretation understanding of what you are saying that is an abstraction right and and that machines are very poor at abstractions right and so the point here is to uh, you know again the the research that the most excite me is uh, the research where I want to make machines intelligent. And what, is, what, what does intelligence mean? Uh, if you listen to my, uh, this talk, I also talked about what, what intelligence, you know, it's, it's a very difficult and complex uh, question, but I did give my, my take at what is the um, intelligence. All right, so that was a long, um, uh, you know, discussion about uh, question. Okay, next question. Uh, yes. Um, when you were talking about the uh, emojis and context, um, um, one, I'm wondering how large the uh, the data set is in size of like uh, gigabytes. Um, and that'll lead into the next one with um, when you're using context, is there a way to determine uh, or is it feasible to look at like political standing? because that also affects the way that emojis are used. Um, and same with like rhetoric that people are speaking. Um, and yeah. the reason I ask is because if it was feasible, the amount of data you would need would be significantly larger than just what was needed for the, the context of the emojis. Um, so I was just wondering if it's uh, actually feasible with our current uh, like petabyte uh, drivers and stuff like that. Yeah, so uh, it's an excellent question. And at the same time, um, it's a question that um, comes more from people who are too steep in understanding the data and have not quite yet figured out the rule of knowledge. So I want to make a general comment and try to then, uh, you know, take your question and, you know, look at different parts of the question. That's just too many dimensions. Uh, we can, I can literally talk about, uh, uh, hour if not more on, on this thing but let's look okay. at a few things one very important thing is you 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 point out the you know that you need more data to make um, uh, to, to gain better understanding or handle a problem and this is um, certainly the case when you are doing a data pure data driven strategy so um, in the area of deep learning more the merrier more the data better you can do in general that's a rule of thumb what my line of work does here is to uh, break that cycle and that dependency on just pure data so uh, we can now show that just more data doesn't do necessarily good because it is also possible that more data may get more noise. So um, there's some wonderful discussion about GPT-3 and uh, now uh, Google is uh, open sourcing one with billion parameters. GPT-3 is about 175 million parameters. Now we have billion parameters or I don't know, I'm, I'm missing, uh, or is it all trillion? It's just massive numbers. Now what is happening is that people are increasingly understanding that um, this doesn't mean that uh, more is merry. Um, they are asked, they are finding out that it also depends on actually what data it is being trained on. 
So there are some interesting blogs, and I may post it in our um, thing uh, about um, issues on choosing the right data in, in in your training. Even if you are training massive model, model based on massive data, even there it is valuable that you put in some work to filter out bad data. That uh, you know. Uh, so for example, um, using GPT three. Uh, a, an agent got very quickly trained to be, um, uh, oh yeah, so the, an agent essentially helped, um, uh, uh, basically answered a, uh, a patient uh, uh, that something was wrong with patient and um, uh, basically the uh, more, uh, model advice uh, commits suicide. Okay. That is a you know, very, very well reported incidents by the way. You can just Google, I think, GPT theme suicide or something like that and you'll get it. And the point is, though, that it is now the only way to um, um, handle these kind of problems of big data is, uh, or not only way, there are a couple of ways I can think of. One is to curate the data, and the second is to have knowledge, to have better context. And uh, the knowledge can be very widespread. So I will share with you because you went into political and other other very interesting aspect of the context. Let me uh, share with you something. I'm very um, um, uh, interest. Uh, I'm very uh, excited about. So um, I'm going to go to um, uh, my my blogs on LinkedIn. Um, there's probably easier way to get there, but if you look at um, uh, here will be the yeah so here are my articles and uh, here is um uh one article uh this one knowledge um look at the title knowledge graph to empower humanity inspired ai computing uh and by the way so this is with uh Hemant Puroi, who was my former phd student and he is a professor at George Mason University. Another colleague who is, is a cognitive scientist, a professor. So here, what we discuss is, um, you know, this um, diagram that you see here. It, it tells you that we have talked about knowledge graph. You have seen, but it says that what 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 we talked about in, in terms of knowledge graph is basically knowledge graph about the, just the information. But when you want to make intelligent systems, you are also implying you want to make a system that is human-like. But humans are a pretty complicated beast. Uh, I mean, we talk about domain-specific knowledge, or oh, that's fine, and common sense knowledge. But we also have value, collective societal value or individual value. We also have, um, you know, um, social norms and individual norms. And then we have, for example, culture. This talks about culture and belief systems. So here is a very interesting example, interaction scenario between a machine and, let's say, so agent and, um, and, and, and human, elder individual and AI assistant. And the kind of uh, you know, assistance, knowledge level, Personalized needs of the assistant, uh, state action and goals, and value and social norms. So, elder individual nurse and AI assistant, elder individual family and AI assistant, elder individual retirement community and AI assistant. So, all these different contexts, you have to, um, you know, you have a different uh, knowledge that comes into the context. Similarly, political knowledge, see, uh, or context of political. Uh, 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 you know, system. Uh, so, uh, a conservatism and uh, belief in smaller government, or or a liberal or or progressive, and belief belief in uh, you know social values, uh, sub, uh, government role in social services. So, these are the things that are out there, and when humans interact with each other, they are automatically there. Uh, by by having a common uh, two Americans with knowledge, basic knowledge of the constitution will automatically apply that in their conversation. What happens to the soft age agent? They will be seen as very brittle. Anyway, 
so um, uh, on the uh, uh, one after the next lecture uh, hemant is going to by the way i, I invited him to give a, 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 a talk at this uh, class and i'll be posting his uh, paper that he'll be talking about um, uh, soon um, anyway uh, so the um, uh, one important point that Jonathan and I want to make is that one very powerful no, uh, role of knowledge is to reduce the need for uh, um, large amount of data for getting some work done at high enough quality and to also reduce the need for training. What happens is that when we create knowledge graphs, let us take an example of um, um, uh, 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 DVpedia, which is extracted from Wikipedia. So, in some in form, some fair form, it is an abstract of Wikipedia, right? DVpedia. Now, when I use DVpedia as part of my computational system, I am somehow taking part of the knowledge created by tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people who create and maintain Wikipedia into this process. Uh, my assuming that the knowledge in Wikipedia is relevant to the problem you are solving, coverage. I am doing fantastic job compared to asking three or four um, uh, annotators to label the data. How much knowledge four annotators have and how much agreement they have. Wikipedia, people are going to edit and uh, some people are going to argue and some people are going to remove your edit and they are going, you know. All that collective, um, uh, you know, uh, editing that goes on is a process of having uh, agreement, societal agreement that is captured. It's called ontological commitment. That makes, uh, you know, the very powerful uh, information uh, knowledge that is brought in compared to your uh, labeling, right? And what if you don't have right laborers? Uh, you know, uh, uh, you know. You, if you if you are talking about mental health and you take mechanical turkers to do that, that will be a terrible uh, you know quality of uh, uh, labeling, right? So the point here is that um, the equation is not just of having larger data. The equation is much more complex, and particularly the equation becomes more solvable when you can also bring in. Uh, 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 knowledge graphs. We talked about in earlier talks, you know, things you can create a knowledge graph uh, manually. You can uh, tap into large sources somewhere else, uh, like DBpedia. Uh, you have UMLS in in medical systems, and so on and so forth. There are many many places to um, you know borrow from to create the knowledge you want. And there is whole bunch of techniques to how to get the relevant knowledge to apply in your intelligence system. So um, uh, the idea would be to bring in, uh, to, to create a system that is able to represent the context. In your case, you gave an example of political context. And um, uh, just like this diagram is showing you, you know, that there are other aspects of the context, right? And uh, corresponding and, and try and bring uh, the power of the knowledge to, reduce the need for data and data and labeling also. Um, did I capture most of your question? Yes, you did. Okay. Okay, next. Uh, Dr. Shahid, I have a question. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there any study uh, showing that uh, bias exists in the knowledge graph embeddings? I can't think of right away, but I would, uh, but I think that that seems pretty uh, normal. Yes, uh, that certainly would be, um, uh, you know, bias in the embeddings. Obviously, you know, uh, you, you, at the end of the day, uh, you are creating embedding from data. You are creating embedding from knowledge graph, right? And all, all, both the data and knowledge are biased. Almost everything is biased, by definition. Imagine so many, there's so much example, for example, you know, um, I was in Singapore and, uh, you know, talking to the doctors and they say, well, there's all these uh, studies in US for Anglo-Saxons, but that doesn't apply to a session, isn't it? 
right? So the bias is there everywhere in this way hidden. I'll give you another example, exa example that is relevant to you and me. That for uh, all this uh, norm, I just earlier I was, I was giving you example of um, blood pressure, uh, which is heavily tied to uh, heart uh, 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 diseases, right? Hypertension and uh, chronic heart conditions and uh, acute decomposition heart failure or heart, uh, you know, a heart attack. These are uh, all relevant to the blood pressure. And the, the, the fact is that um, um, for a given elevated blood pressure, um, the, uh, let's say, a typical um, white uh, Westerner, European or American, would have a much lesser chance of heart disease than a typical Asian. And the reason are multiple. Uh, the reasons include, um, uh, and the same thing, uh, the, the reasons, uh, uh, the, the reasons are genetic, lifestyle, and body structure. For example, the size of your arteries, right, and, uh, and such. The, uh, the the difference is also between male and female. Recently, we wrote a proposal with uh, University of California, San Francisco, one of the top medical school, where uh, the proposal, if it is funded, we will uh, research uh, how um, women are getting um, a poorer outcome of of of, of um, uh, in the case of their heart uh, conditions. So when they go to see doctors for a particular, uh, you know, heart condition or basic cardio, no, cardiovascular uh, related disease, they see the doctors later in the disease development, hence the outcome is bad. They um, have other reasons why um, they don't get aggressive enough treatment as male do. Just the same way, the same thing is happening with racial divide that, uh, you know, the treatment that we are getting in the US, particularly more than other places for, uh, you know, different races is different. Outcome is different. We, uh, with the COVID, uh, uh, you know, African-Americans uh, had a, a reduction of 2.7 years um, in the, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, what you call uh, time that they would live uh, versus the average of 0.9 years, right? So that, so this is it, that, that, that the point here is that there's a bias in society and the bias in data and the bias in knowledge. Uh, all this uh, knowledge uh, that is on uh, Wikipedia in English is not so applicable to, uh, to somebody in China. There's a different political system, different social system, different value system. So it's not, right? And I mean, I wouldn't say one is better than other. It is what it is. It's different. So um, uh, they, that's, that's very, very important. The problem is, uh, the one point I, I'll make it before moving on is that because now we deal with larger and larger data, uh, uh, you know, corpuses, uh, it, is, it has become harder and harder to identify the bias. Hidden, because data bias is in how the data was created. Bias is in how, what was the subject on which observations were made. Bias in whoever interpreted the results and wrote the reports. It's all these places. So this kind of knowledge graph that I'm talking about is the way to indicate that we need to explicitly recognize all of these things. And, and, and factor in when you rely so much on the data. Okay, any next question? Yeah, um, I had one uh, relating back to the emoji net. Um, so this was just a curiosity that I had. Um, I know that uh, this is more of a NLP or I guess SLP for symbol language processing uh, task. Um, and it's different than image processing. Um, but do you think the type of uh, knowledge-based architecture could be extended to uh, 
gathering context from real human expressions of emotion um, yeah. rather than just uh, the emo emoji symbols. Yes, absolutely. I mean, there are already a number of systems that um, uh, uh, associate um, uh, emotion with uh, uh, different morality. Uh, it, uh, there is emo there are um, uh, uh, AI systems that are trained to understand uh, emotion uh, from photographs, from uh, video uh, feed in real time. Uh, my own company, uh, well, it's not my company, the company I founded, Cognovi Labs, uh, is uh, about emotion in t uh, text. Uh, so, so in, in social media uh, uh, text. But what about um, gathering context from those emotions, like the, uh, the EmojiNet does? Well, again, it, it is, is, that would be a progress, but never go, it's never going to be a, a, a complete, it will never catch up to the real world. In the context of you know, think about a photograph or a video. That's just what you are looking at now. You won't even know who is on the side of that person, right? And why the person has that um, uh, expression. So, uh, but um, but what what happens here is that uh, you know, you can um, you know generally train this system, label the data. Ten people will say yes, this one is this versus that. Just the same way that we have sense, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, as as the way to organize emotions, you can have uh, emotions, and you can have other things, whatever you know, other um, characteristics you want to associate with the data. But yeah, you can uh, certainly uh, bring in um, the um, uh, human. But you have to be very careful. For example, uh, a typical, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, you know, uh, the emoji that we use all the time is this, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, laughing out loud and with tears, right? LOL is has uh, emoji of tear, right? Uh, you are you you are you are laughing so hard that you have tears coming out. Well, how many times we have we see that in real world? Very few times, right? How many times for in the same situation you write down LOL many more times compared to you physically have tears, right? So these are, um, uh, you know, uh, challenging issues. That is why uh, we need to collaborate also. Here uh, we are using, working with Valerie Shell, who is a psychologist. So, and, 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 and uh, now Hemant, who actually did computer science with me, is more on humanitarian informatics or, or, or um, uh, social computing, right? So uh, anyway, so yeah, but in, 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 you know, bringing in uh, knowledge from um, understanding human expressions is a very interesting thing and people are cataloging it already. Great, thank you. Okay, um, so, um, uh, let us uh, uh, do housekeeping a little bit. Uh, uh, in the next class, then we are, where is the, Um, so here I have posted um, uh, what do we have for the next class. Um, so we, we this is class six. Uh, uh, no, this class seven, uh, February nineteen. Um, the next class is going to be on. Um, I, by the way, um, uh, will be primarily on this um, uh, semantic cognitive perceptual computing. But what I want to uh, do is to um, uh, point out to some of you who are, um, some of you who may find this um, uh, 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 class and the current subject matters interesting. I want to point out, so I want you to read this, uh, you know, listen to this video and this article, of course, which uh, I'll give the link. But I want you to particularly pay attention to these, um, major people, uh, McCarthy, 
वाइजर इंगलबार्ट एंड लिक लाइडर एंड सर्टनली तो दोज ऑफ यू आर माई स्टूडेंट्स I particularly encourage you to read uh, these uh, also. Uh, those who want to go deeper into the specifics of implementation of something that talks about, can go to this paper. Um, uh, Corey Hansen, uh, he was my PhD student, and uh, uh, or his PhD thesis goes into a much more detail on on one of the reasons. This this is a term we had coined semantic perception. Uh, so this at a, at a higher level, uh, article level, it is this twelve. Otherwise, you go to thirteen. So those are the things that you want to um, you know uh, look at to prepare for the next class. The other thing is that I want you to um, uh, I want to ask uh, everybody uh, whether you have read this paper. Oops, that's not what I want. So one of the uh, you know giants of machine learning uh, is Pedro Dominguez, uh, and Pedro has uh, you know uh, written a lot of papers in machine learning. But this is a nice um, overview paper. A few useful things to know about machine learning. I want uh, uh, I want to uh, um, uh, certainly I want everyone uh, because machine learning is probably useful for everyone in this class. I want you to uh, read this paper or at least scan it um, and see what he talks about. Um, if necessary, I can, uh, you know, uh, we can pick a couple of students who can discuss this in great detail. Um, and I want you to pay, you know, under, pay attention to several interesting things. Look what he says here: data alone is not enough. Right? Uh, and um, this is, by the way, 2012 paper. I talked about this. Um, in the implicit, formal, and uh, explicit, it's a 2005 paper, but this has he has written fantastically. So I would certainly, you know, uh, everybody working uh, interested in knowledge and such should read this paper uh, for sure. Uh, that that particular section, and um, uh, here uh, interesting thing is that he talks about feature engine the key. This part has become outdated, right? So with the deep learning. Feature engineering has become outdated, completely gone. Shoot, right? So that is very interesting. Uh, here is a very interesting thing that a lot of people believed in. More data beats a cleverer algorithm. A lot of people believe in that. Now the pendulum is moving back. So he's, this is not what everybody believes anymore. More data has um, more also challenges. Like some points, pointers I made. So this is not something that um, uh, you know is um, uh, this is not the only thing that um, I, I guess this 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 wisdom is being challenged now. Learning many models, uh, not just one, is very interesting. Coin. Uh, okay. Um, Repositable. Okay. So, so some wonderful. Uh, uh, and this one, uh, you know, uh, is very, very popular. Correlation does not imply causation. Uh, again, a very fundamental uh, uh, piece of insight that everybody should have. Okay, so um, so so do look at that and uh, let me know if you think we need to discuss this, uh, or I can look for his uh, video, or you can you can look for the video of his. Actually, there are uh, uh, videos of his giving this lecture, so that may be a best way to. Also complement what what is happening here. All right, um, so that is the plan, um, and um, uh, there is a lot of. Um, um, I hope that uh, you know some of the things that I talk about here will excite you, uh, uh, excite some of you. Um, as a um, uh, you know, one of the exciting thing for me was that when I gave this talk. Um, uh, in 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 um, Germany, um, the other I was giving a keynote, and other person giving keynote is was Raj Reddy. Uh, if you don't know Raj Reddy, you should know. If you're in AI, he's um, a Turing Award winner, uh, a professor at CMU, one of the top guys. I I really admired him, and it was wonderful. Uh, he you know um, he really liked my talk also, and we had very good conversation. Um, uh, about this, and he talked about the, what I said when he went and visited to IBM on his own. So uh, that is that is very very uh, interesting. Um, um, 
just anecdote kind of thing. Um, but uh, at least I was able to convince him that these ideas are interesting for future um, topics in AI. So let's see what you guys think, and we'll talk more about it in the next class. If, you, if there's anything else, um, I encourage you to discuss here, put a question, you can tag me, or otherwise reach out to me separately by email. All right, then we'll end the lecture now. And um, we'll also need to end the recording.